Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you this month's installment of the E4C seminar series. This series was spearheaded by ASME's Engineering for Global Development Research Committee, and its purpose is to intellectually develop the field of engineering for global development. We host a new research institution monthly to learn about their work advancing United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and more. Today's seminar is presented by Dr. Jeffrey Walters uh, from the Civil Engineering Department at George Fox University. My name is Jan Aranda, and I'm the president at Engineering for Change, and I'll be one of the moderators of today's seminar. The seminar you're participating in will be archived on E4C site and on our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide. Information on upcoming seminars is available on our site, and E4C members will receive invitations to those seminars directly. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact our team at research at engineeringforchange.org. And if you're following us on Twitter today, please join the conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C Seminar Series. Before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about E4C. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of these may include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding falls, fellowships, and more. Members also receive exclusive invitations to online and regional events and access to resources aligned to their interests. Please visit our website to learn more and sign up. Our research work cuts across geographies and sectors to deliver an ecosystem view of technology for good. Original research is conducted by Engineering for Change Research Fellows annually on behalf of our partners and sponsored, sponsors and delivered as digestible reports with implementable insights. Well, you are invited to check out our research page. You see the URL listed on the slide to explore our field insights, research collaborations, and review the State of Engineering for Global Development, a compilation of academic programs and institutions offering training in this sector. If you have a research question or want to work with us on a research project as a fellow, please contact us at research and engineeringforchange.org. And on that note, I, I'd like to share uh, an overview of our current cohort who is actively doing uh, ecosystem research in 2020 from around the globe, demonstrated here through this map. Nearly 60% of them are women. They represent a variety of uh, skills, including uh, interdisciplinary um, contributions from aerospace, architecture, civil and environmental engineering, uh, and nutritional food science, and software engineering from all around the globe. If you're interested in becoming a fellow, please explore the URL on this uh, slide, and uh, please do feel free to apply. Now, we want to move on to a few critical housekeeping items. I, I know most of you around the globe are now familiar with how to use Zoom uh, given current circumstances, but we are really uh, wanted to hear from you and make sure that you are putting your questions and your comments into the right place. So please kindly click on the chat uh, window and share with us where in the world you are joining us from today. We want to see where you're from. So I'm here today in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I see folks from uh, Oregon, from London, from Arizona and California, from Sweden, from Calgary in Canada, and more Brooklynites. Welcome. Texas and Switzerland, DC and Kenya, Nairobi, Denver, Karachi. Welcome. So fantastic. Welcome. We are so thrilled to see you here from Nigeria and Pennsylvania, across the globe. So, so awesome. 
Um, just as a reminder, you can use the chat window to share remarks uh, during the seminar. And if you have any technical questions, you are very welcome to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. Um, just search in, in the participants. If you're listening uh, and you have any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. Um, and then please do use the, the Q&A functionality for any questions that you have for our presenter today. This will allow us to, to keep track of those questions. All right. Um, oh, I'm so thrilled. I see uh, one of our past contributing editors has also joined us as a listener. We're so thrilled to have you. Hey, Sean. All right. So with that, uh, I am so honored uh, to introduce um, our, our presenter and our, also our uh, fearless lead in this uh, as next. So Dr. Jeff Walters is an assistant professor of civil engineering at George Fox University. His research seeks to develop and refine decision support techniques rooted in the complexities in complexity science and systems thinking to improve engineering practice and policy for sustainable rural and urban infrastructure system design and management in developing rural contexts. His research has been applied within the sectors of WASH, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that acronym, that's Water and Sanitation and Hygiene, Energy, Food, and Engineering Education. And uh, the man who needs no introduction, but will get a brief one, is our uh, co-moderator, the co-chair of our Engineering Research Development Committee, Dr. Jesse Austin Brenneman, who's an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan, with his beautiful bio, which you, which you can read at your leisure. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you, Jeff, to share your presentation. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, by the way. This is, this is, this is really an honor for me. Thank you. Let's, let's not start the problem. We have enough problems in our lives right now. Um, Right. So again, it's, it really is an honor to be presenting this research that, that and to say that it's my research is, seems a little bit uh, disingenuous because of how many folks that I've worked with on this, this work. And, and, and so the, the main goal of this presentation really is to, to engage in this discourse with you all, and to hopefully get some more collaborators on uh, to do more of this work uh, moving forward. So um, this research really focuses on applying systems thinking systems tools uh, to improve upon the sustainability of, of service delivery, not just of water, but it could be, it's, it's issue agnostic, it's, it's, it's energy, it's food, it's, it's any sort of infrastructure. So let's get into it. Uh, so here's a quick overview, right? And uh, really, I, I think the case is pretty easy to make uh, for a need for systems thinking and, and, and rural water supply, it could be for sanitation as well, or energy, food. There's a need to understand systems. Um, and I'm gonna highlight two approaches that I've been working on with collaborators. That hopefully this, is, this can uh, stimulate some interesting conversation with you all. Um, a stakeholder-driven approach that is sort of getting stakeholders, local stakeholders thinking in systems and, and extracting systems insights. And then an evaluation of stakeholder understanding, which is a bit of an abstract idea. And I, and I look forward to diving into that a little bit. Um, do these approaches actually improve stakeholder understanding? And then briefly highlight where the blind spots are and areas to, for future research and collaboration with you all um, that I hope um, gets us going on a good discussion. So the problem, okay, so you guys have probably seen this many times, but there's a lot of people that don't have access to clean water, right? Um, despite many efforts, there's still about 800 million people that don't have access to water. That's, that's unfortunate, right? But I think the more unfortunate aspect, really, and, and, and am I sharing my screen? Are you guys all seeing this as well? So I need to get this out of here. So, no, um, no, we just see we just see the problem. And okay. uh, oh, I thought you were seeing my chat window. Okay. We are not seeing your chat window. Right, to Thanks. Um, so yeah, the big issue here is that the interventions in the past have have not been super successful. Um, a large failure rate, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, water points failing. Uh, gravity fed systems failing, um, et cetera. And so, and, and, and what comes as no surprise is that th these failures are a, a result of a complex interaction of factors and, and how actors interact within that system. Um, but there's, there's interlinking interactions of factors, there's dynamics that exist between those factors. Um, and, and ultimately, what this is is sort of 
complexity. There's, there's a complexity at play, a complex adaptive system is what it's been called in the past, um, that, is, that makes it hard to plan for sustainable interventions, um, both in water, in water as well as other types of uh, development pursuits. So, the, so regarding water specifically, um, how do we plan and manage sustainable water services in, in light of these complexities, kind of um, learning to dance, so to speak, with the system? Um, and so that's what the, that's what my research thrust has been over the past eight years is really is it possible to model the system and again these systems are are, are social systems they're political systems uh, they're they're economic systems environmental systems technical systems supply chain systems all sorts of different systems coming together to affect sustainability is it possible to do that with local stakeholders in an, in an accessible way engaging the, the intimate understanding of local stakeholders um, in that process. And then is it, is it possible to evaluate whether the approaches did what we hoped they did um, in, in getting stakeholders thinking in systems or at least changing their understanding for how uh, different factors interact um, to impact systems outcomes. And again, so what I mean by system isn't necessarily just the water system itself, but instead sort of all of the sort of soft systems that surround the maintenance of that system. Um, and then lastly, how does this impact, uh, this is what we want to get at, right? Service sustainability and, and high, high service performance. How does that change in understanding impact actions that, that impact service delivery? And really the whole idea of this research is to, is to automate this process, to make it so that you can continually go through this process of mapping, evaluating understanding, taking action, evaluating action, mapping, and so on and so forth. It's a cyclical process of adaptive learning and action. So that's kind of the high level view of my research. Um, and I want to highlight, this is research that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, both my colleagues as well as years and years and years of systems research um, in this area of complexity science. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. This is a, a really, if you guys have a chance to look at this at some point, just look at this up, a map of complexity science by Frank Castellani. Um, it, this is an actually, an inter, it's an interactive map. You can click on all these different uh, tools that have been used over the past, geez, 80 years, 70 years. Um, the tools that I'm exploiting, so to speak, are those in system dynamics um, and in soft systems analysis. So soft systems analysis is really just getting folks together and, and talking about and diagramming. Could be pictures, could be arrows, could be words. Just getting folks kind of thinking in systems in a very, very abstract and qualitative way. Now, System dynamics simulation and system dynamics modeling is largely focused on parameterizing these complex systems, actually putting, putting quantitative uh, variables into the model and using uh, differential equations and seeing how things change and doing hypotheses in that way and testing hypotheses. Um, my research focuses kind of at the nexus of these two approaches, where the goal is to get local stakeholders with their intimate knowledge um, an understanding of the system, uh, engaged in systems diagramming and systems modeling to, to make better decisions based on uh, their understanding. Um, so it's both kind of quantitative and qualitative to make decisions based on leverage points that are identified. So use, this is known as sort of structural analysis or group model building and system dynamics modeling. Uh, and the idea is this is sort of a stakeholder driven structural factor analysis for lack of a better word. Um, and but the, the goal of these, uh, this approach is to is to develop a sort of a, a robust systems diagram or factor map that that uh, represents sort of stakeholders understanding of their local system and then to then once you have this map pull out leverage points pull out feedback mechanisms influence between factors centrality as a means to identify leverage points from a systems perspective so that's kind of the goal of this um, this is based on some uh, previous work that I've done um, in, in Nicaragua um, and for lack of a better word we're just going to call this stakeholder a stakeholder driven structural factor analysis and this approach that I'm continuing to develop with partners is, is quite simple it, it involves brainstorming factors getting 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 stakeholders in a room brainstorming factors that impact a particular outcome let's just say service delivery of water um, condensing those factors into a digestible form, obviously you can get a lot of factors, brainstorm, but the, the goal is to get between 10 and 15 factors to, to maintain some complexity and nuance, but not having it be um, unmanageable. And then mapping the interaction between those interactions, or mapping the interaction between those factors, you can see in that picture that's kind of that's showing a facilitator doing that. 
Um, and then performing a systems analysis, and that's what I showed before, really sort of dissecting that systems diagram to pull out uh, sort of um, leverage points and places to intervene in the system. Um, and then uh, sharing those results with stakeholders. So I wanted to run you through what this looks like really quick. So again, the goal is to get to this factor map that you can then dissect to pull out leverage points from a systems perspective. Um, so first, identify the factors. Um, so, you, so you basically ask the stakeholders, what do you think are the factors that, that in this case influence sustainable water services in your regional context, for example? Where one of those factors is also the outcome that you're looking at. I'll, I'll explain why that is important in a second. Okay. And then you engage them in a process that's somewhat arduous. <laughs> um, it takes between four to six hours, depending on the size of the matrix and the, or the number of factors that are, that are considered. But you fill out this table, and this is called a cross-impact matrix. And you can just draw this on a board. And, and we've done this with, without any access to electricity, right? You just draw this on the board, just draw a grid, and you get the stakeholders sort of considering every single interaction that could exist in the system between these factors. Um, so let's talk about what this might look like. So one of these cells, let's just say community and operations and maintenance. So what that cell means, uh, and, you, and you step the stakeholder through this process, you go and say, okay, based on the current conditions, how do you think community influences operations and maintenance? And this in and of itself is quite interesting. It's, it's an arrow <laughs> uh, between community and operations and maintenance, an influence between community and operations and maintenance. You say, how does that what is the effect there? Is there an influence? Yes or no? If there isn't, great. There's no, there's no effect. If there is, then you say, okay, is there a positive or negative influence? Um, in other words, if one increases, does the other increase? If one becomes better, does the other become better, and vice versa? And a negative would be kind of an, in, uh, an inverse uh, relationship. If one goes up, the other goes down. This gets at dynamics. Okay, and we can talk about that. We'll talk about that in, uh, in a sec. Um, and then you ask, what is the strength of interconnection? Is it, is it a weak, moderate, or strong strength? And this allows us to really kind of add a little bit of granularity in terms of which factors are the most influential in the overall system. And what's really great about this, this process is, is the robust conversations that result from, from this, from each cell. Each of these cells, I've, to my chagrin at times, because it makes it take a lot longer, <laughs> uh, have had 10 minute long conversations about just one cell. Why does that, does that factor influence that factor? And the idea of doing this in a pairwise way is, is to extract local, really rich information about a very complex system. We, uh, we as people can't conceptualize all these interactions at once, but we can at least consider individually a pairwise interaction between one on the other. And this circles back around, and this, this would also have operations and maintenance on community as well. So what results is a, yeah, as an impact matrix filled with, filled with a bunch of numbers, which is uh, interesting. But what it does is it allows you to sort of draw the factor map or the, or the model and then to pull out those sort of um, insights, those, those leverage points. So I'll, I'll step you through a couple of these, these leverage points. But first, the factor map. You look at this thing and you go, this thing is, I, I, can't, get, I can't get much from this. And that's usually, the, and that's okay. A lot of times the main thing that we, that we get from this sort of factor map is to show the stakeholder group, oh my gosh, look at how interconnected these things are. And a lot of times you just see the look on the, their faces, like, oh my gosh, They're, this shows that this is, this is not just as e a simple task here. It's not just one simple um, factor influencing uh, service delivery, for example. Um, but then we, we step the stakeholders through this process of looking at there's this idea of influence and dependence. A factor influences how many factors um, and the strength of interaction a factor has on other factors, sort of the arrow leaving the factor, and the dependence is sort of the influence from other factors on said factor. And if you map this in an influence map, it's possible to sort of identify leverage points. So let's, let's go through this. So what we see here is if, if you have a high influence and low dependence, that would mean that you would probably want to target those factors because they wouldn't feed, they, there wouldn't be any feedback on those, on those factors and they could influence the system in a very controlled way. Um, let's look at this in, in, in the example of water service delivery. So what we see here is community and capacity building and coordination, for example, would be a place to intervene in the system and, and really, and really uh, fortify, so to speak. Whereas we see in the upper right that policy um, has both high influence and high dependence, which would mean it's very important. It's, it, 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 
have a large influence on the rest of the system, but in and of itself circles, it circles back uh, from, from all the other interactions back on policy. So there's a potential volatility um, that, that is, or an instability. If, if, pol if, if policy isn't protected, this, this system could spiral out of control. And then in the lower, lower right hand, we see um, what we would expect where water service delivery and operations and maintenance is, is highly dependent on sort of the outcome. Whereas the lower left is generally low significance, which in this case would show the users are, are, are not super impactful on the system uh, as a whole, which folks may disagree with, but that's, this is just an example. Um, another way to look at this is as a network and to use sort of network theory, um, centrality to pull out which factors are the most influential on the system, most important. Um, this is using between the centrality or the, the bridging of the importance of factors, ability to bridge other factors, and then looking at that and saying, okay, those are the leverage points of the system. So we would see here that financing and coordination based on this analysis are the leverage points. And then lastly, uh, the analysis of feedback loops, actually systematically pulling out feedback mechanisms um, specifically feedback mechanisms that impact the outcome variable, so for example, water services in this case, um, and then you systematically identifying which ones are the most important. And that has to do with a lot of, uh, with normalizing the influences and sort of, there could be hundreds and hundreds of, of feedback mechanisms, but the goal is to sort of identify 10 feedback mechanisms that can influence uh, service sustainability in this case. An example here is if water services continue to function well, operations and maintenance will be easier to do or, or done in a more effective way, which will make water, water services more sustainable. So that's an, that's an example of that reinforcing R3 uh, loop there. So that's another analysis we can do. And again, the goal of this is to look at the system as, as the stakeholders have conceptualized it. It isn't necessarily the real system, but it's a, it's a system that is conceptualized by those stakeholders um, and identify the leverage point based on the interaction between factors, not just saying finances is important. Finances is important because it interacts with factor A, factor B, factor C, et cetera. Um, and in so doing through these different analyses, it's, it is possible to hone in on really what are, where are the leverage points using these, using these, um, these uh, analyses in, in concert, we might say in this case, let's focus on policy, community, and regulations because it has a high influence, low dependence, high centrality, and, and, and a high amount of, uh, and a high referencing feedback, um, or a high, a high feedback strength. So this has been done in a number of different places between East Africa, uh, Central America, and, and uh, South America. Um, and but it's largely been research that has been done with the help of funds from uh, USAID um, through channeled through the Sustainable Wash Systems Learning Partnership, um, which is working in East Africa and is, was a grant that was won by uh, the University of Colorado and I've called University of Colorado Boulder and I've been working with them over the past four years on this research. So thank, thanks to those, those folks. Uh, so future research in this area of stakeholder driven structural factor analysis is to do more of this, continue to, to refine the approach, evaluate impact, I'll talk about that more in a second, and really to, to refine the process. And what this requires necessarily is to develop a software. I'm sure some of you computer science folks are looking at this and like, oh man, this could be automated. Well, the process of developing these diagrams as a structure, or as a <laughs> the civil engineer or civil systems engineer, I don't I, we do this in a very brute force way. Um, and it takes, it can take hours upon hours upon hours to develop these models. And so we don't oftentimes get to share those models to the stakeholders in real time, which is, which is problematic. So developing an icon based software that we can run stakeholders through this process and, 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 and output real time analyses of the, of the system so that we can discuss them with everybody in the room. That's where this is going. Okay, so that was talking about sort of how to get system or how to get stakeholders thinking in systems and extracting systems insights to make better decisions. Now, the other part of my research is focused on, well, what is the impact of these interventions? Not necessarily factor mapping per se, but other systems approaches, getting stakeholders thinking about the interaction of factors. Does it actually impact their understanding? And so I'll move on to this, this part of the research here. Um, so the goal here is to, is to evaluate whether stakeholders that have engaged in some systems thinking approaches 
um, whether it's talking about uh, social network analysis, doing fact talking about uh, life cycle analysis, et cetera, engaging systems in thinking in, in, in stakeholders, did it actually impact their understanding of the interaction of factors? And so the unit of analysis for this research is to really say, if we can extract their mental model, this comes from social science theory, system dynamics theory, uh, essentially a mental model is the way in which a person uh, conceptualizes the interaction of, of things that lead to a particular outcome. We all have mental models, whether it's what we're gonna go to the grocery store and buy, the food we're gonna order, who we're gonna marry, what house we're gonna buy, et cetera. Um, and, and so if we can extract this mental model of, from people, it's possible to evaluate the shifts, any shifts in understanding it that a particular intervention, systems intervention had on that, on that understanding. Um, and so this has been research that has been done largely with the help of uh, the Sustainable Wash Systems uh, Partnership um, in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Kenya with a number of local stakeholders. We've interviewed these folks. Um, and so we're talking hand pump mechanics, local government officials. And we have over 500 pages of text so far. And this is, the goal is to inter interview these folks at three different time steps with the same questions and to see if their understanding has shifted. Um, of, on the interaction of factors. So this has been done or will be done on three different time steps. So far we've looked at baseline and midline. Um, that's between 2016 and 17, 2018 and 19. And the end line interviews have, have yet to be done. They're going to be done in the next couple of months. And, and the interviews that we ask these folks in these interviews, we say, okay, what do you think are the main challenges impacting service delivery, of water and sanitation? And what are some of the solutions that you would suggest to, to, to address these challenges? And in getting them talking, it's, it's possible to, to sort of, uh, in transcribing what they say, extract their mental models. So if, let's just say a, a person said, um, the sustainability of water services is driven by the ability of the water user community to operate and maintain the water system. That represents a causal statement. And so it's possible to, in asking these very pointed questions, um, to say, okay, um, that represents a causal statement. So, so if, we, if we can, how do we, can we extract that causal statement? And we see there's a, actually an approach called purpose of text analysis and system dynamics modeling where we, you actually code these, these causal statements. So what we would see here is, okay, water user committee capacity causes an effect on operations and maintenance, causes an effect on, on service sustainability. In other words, you can pull out systematically cause and effect factors that then lead insight into how the stakeholders understand how factors interact. And you do that at different time steps, it's possible to see changes in those cause and effect factors um, to see if there's been a shift in understanding of, of, those, in, of those interactions. Um, and that can be done based on looking at the challenge and solution questions, seeing how those factors are different for those different questions, and also look at different stakeholder groups and see how different stakeholder groups have shifted their understanding over time, among other things. Um, and what's interesting here is you do this enough times, and this takes a long time, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about that in a second, but you, you, you code these transcripts, let's just say you get 20 causal um, statements um, from one interview. You do this with 30 stakeholders for a particular region and you get 600 interactions, right? You get a rich, rich representation of that stakeholder group's understanding of the system, which allows you to, to thereby evaluate um, understanding and how shifts in that understanding on factors has, has taken place. Um, so this is, a, this is a graphic that would show and again, the goal, the crux here is trying to show how understanding of factor interactions has changed. But this is an example of how we're presenting this for, for, Ken, for a, a case in Kenya where the factors that were identified through the coding were operations and maintenance, service sustainability, finances, et cetera. And we, and we can show here a, a change in the, the reference, the percent of reference to effect, of effect factors and cause factors. So operations and maintenance, you can see here, has decreased as both a cause and effect factor. Let's look at this some more. We see here the service sustainability. Um, what, this, what this chart is showing is if it's a solid line, it's an increase between the baseline uh, interviews and the midline interviews. And a dotted line or dashed line indicates that there's been a decrease in reference. So we see service sustainability becomes more influential in the, in the eyes of these stakeholders. Finances becomes more influential. We see coverage and access becomes more influential. It becomes more of a cause factor, influencing the other factors. Um, conversely, we see uh, external support becoming uh, less influential and less affected. 
Um, and we see here the political influence becomes uh, also less, less, less influential. And again, this isn't saying that the system itself actually is changing in this way. It's showing that the stakeholders' understanding of the system has shifted. Um, and like I said, you do this enough times, and you get some really, we're getting some really, really, really interesting insights on in how people's uh, conceptualization of the system has changed. It's, very, it's a very robust analysis based on both aggregated stakeholders as well as stakeholder groups that can be, they can be parsed into. And that's great, wonderful, but this takes forever. Um, we have 500 pages of, of text that we've been coding, and this takes at least two hours per interview. I mean, it's, it's just, this is thousands of hours of work. Um, and so the goal is to, in making this replicable in the future, um, is to automate this process, to, to be able to allow folks to be able to import uh, transcribed interviews into, the, into, a, into a software, so to speak, that outputs those interactions to evaluate understanding or to potentially evaluate the system itself. And so what we're investigating is the use of natural language processing to, to, to automate that process, importing the sort of the transcribed interview and outputting the, the factor map and the analyses. So lastly, um, this, this idea of seeing if there was a connection between understanding and service performance, right? The holy grail here is we want to impact service delivery. That's what that the outcome is what, we, is what we're interested in. Um, and at this point, it's, it's still a bit of a black box. Um, Largely because to identify and say, okay, whether a stakeholder group's understanding informed actions that, in, that, that led to improved service delivery or sustainability, it takes an enormous amount of time both to do as well as to see if it actually materialized or emerged, right? So sustainability implies that a service worked for a long period of time. So evaluating sustainability in and of itself requires time, and we haven't been able to fully see that yet. This, even this um, USAID partnership, we, we've only had five years to look at service delivery and see shifts in delivery. And, and that's not necessarily a long enough time to see if there was actually the impact that was desired. And then it, 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 this is even harder, attributing uh, shifts in understanding to actions to service delivery. Um, it's it's, it's a quite a spurious and difficult task to do that, but, but is an important task nonetheless. And so future work and steps forward is to really develop more case studies, more and more case studies, engaging with more stakeholder groups, more, more practitioners to, to map the system, get stakeholders thinking in systems, and to evaluate those, uh, those efforts. And so what, we're, what I'm doing with a, a number of colleagues is to develop a consultancy, a, a company that develops both the software to automate the, these processes of mapping and, 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 under, and evaluating stakeholder understanding, but also to just get practitioners to have their stakeholders think in systems or getting local stakeholders to think in systems to, to start having an impact on service delivery now. Uh, we would expect that, that, would, that there would be positive impacts. There. Um, and, and sort of an, a, a separate arm of that consultancy and develop, uh, development of that software is to continue to do research on evaluating the impact uh, on stakeholder understanding and on service delivery and in refining the process of engaging stakeholders in systems. So that's really where it's, where it's at currently, with the goal of, again, automating the process of mapping, evaluating understanding, and evaluating service delivery outcomes, um, and in a way that allows you to adapt to changes in the system. The system is always gonna be changing. Understanding is always gonna be changing. But to be able to be nimble and evaluate that uh, in, a, in a very quick uh, way will lead to this sort of adaptive learning and action that will lead to systems change, positive systems change. So thank you for listening. That was a lot of information to throw at you. I, I, again, the goal was to give you enough information so that we can have a more robust conversation on how to collaborate or, or how to make things clear. And I wanna highlight um, two of my collaborators, Dr. N uh, Nick Valcourt. Um, he and I are starting this company um, that I referred to. And Dr. Walker Orr is a computer science faculty member at uh, George Fox University. He's helping with uh, the uh, natural language processing, the machine learning aspects of this research. So thank you. I look forward to, to chatting more about this with you all. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, we're we're going to invite questions, so please do share your questions in the in the Q and A window. There's a number of them there already. I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, Jesse, and uh, perhaps uh, I'll share my screen here. Oh, if uh, 
if Jeff, if you don't, wouldn't mind stopping okay. sharing yours. All right, over to you, Jesse. Yes, first of all, Jeff, thank you so much. Um, this is the type of research I wish I was doing because it's amazing. So really great wow. stuff. Um, I really like the idea around systems level thinking. We have a lot of questions here around it. Um, I have my own question, so I'm just going to hijack everyone's questions, ask my own, because I'm so interested in it. Um, but I'll start with theirs, so I don't take all of the time. Um, one of the things that I that I was wondering about and is, and is asked here is, what about situations, so you're talking about Uganda, Kenya, these are places in which people do speak English, um, and, and we're part of the Commonwealth at one point, so, so English is a language, so perhaps there's less of this issue, but in places like you mentioned Nicaragua or in South America, um, wondering about the translation in terms of, you know, you're creating these system models, but the language of the factors becomes quite important then, right? So I was wondering if you could speak on two things. So I'll just start first with just translating it in different languages, right? So how do you deal with that situation as you come up with like trying to think about these, these ones? both for interviewing and for creating the stakeholder maps. Right, and, and so this is, this is great. So when it, when it came to um, engaging folks in, in Nicaragua, I did some of this in Chile, um, I speak Spanish, and I was, so I was able to engage with stakeholders in, in, their, in the local language. Obviously keeping it in, in, in the local language is really is key because language has meaning, right? And the, and the meaning of these different factors, while there may be similar factors in different contexts, the, the meaning of those factors is very context specific. The interactions are especially context specific. So when it came to um, Latin America, it was it was I was able to engage in that way. But when it, it was very much different when it came to uh, engaging with folks in Ethiopia and in Amharic, we don't none of none of the researchers knew that language. And so the way that we did that, and and ideally the goal is to get local facilitators to do these factor mapping workshops. Um, and to engage with the stakeholders, first and foremost. But especially if it's a different language, you need to have different, or you need to have local folks that, that know the language, that know the context, that know the stakeholders, doing, actually being facilitators, that you don't need to have some gringo doing these, you know, <laughs> these workshops. Um, and uh, while, yes, certainly there can be, we've sat back in the background, and try to not be not to not to be a hindrance because obviously always having someone different in the room makes things weird <laughs> and excuse the conversation but to have someone in the background at least taking notes and then debriefing with sort of the facilitator afterwards um, and again one of the one of the blind spots here with this with this research so far has been the ability to how do you actually engage the stakeholders afterwards in, in evaluating the system's outputs? Because usually we've had to be like, okay, thank you for engaging in the factor mapping exercise. Now we gotta go back and just kind of process these diagrams and then hopefully present them back to you at some point. Um, and in many cases, we, we haven't been able to present these, these insights back to people. And the main insight that folks can really get is, well, that system's really interconnected and wow, one or two factors were really influential. Um, but so, so that said, uh, the, the translation and sort of the engaging with the, with the stakeholders is absolutely paramount. And so you need to have a really, really good facilitator to engage with them. Because um, at each cell, each interaction has to have consensus. You want to get consensus with the stakeholders. And it, it takes a long, a long time. It takes a lot of rapport with the, with the stakeholders. Um, and it's not something that you can just go in and do. It's, 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 really, it's really sort of an art that the facilitator needs to know how to do. That's a really good question. And it's still something that we're working on, is, is how, do you, how do you develop sort of a, a robust uh, training for facilitators to be able to do these um, workshops? Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I think that's a really great point, thinking about uh, the quality of the facilitator and thinking about the team that you have, the impact on your ability to conduct it. It's not just the process right. that's important, it's like the team and the implementation of that process and the details around that seem incredibly important based on what you're saying. Um, and I agree with that, I think that's a, that's a really great point. And I think it addresses um, many of these, these questions that are coming up around perhaps the quality of the interviewer, the style of the interviewer, addressing variation as you're collecting this qualitative research uh, data, 
um, you know, in those methods, you, you do have to think about your own positionality and perhaps Absolutely. the nationality of people on your team and their characteristics with respect to the community. Um, and so, you know, I think what you're suggesting is perhaps having local facilitators or people that are really engaged with the stakeholders and have a connection with the stakeholders prior to your work may, may be addressing some of those issues already. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really great point. Um, we do have a couple other questions. I think one question that's important is to think about, you talk a lot about, okay, well, our goal is to get people to do systems thinking, basically is what I heard, yep. right? So this is one process by which perhaps by going through this, people can be reflective about thinking, doing systems thinking themselves as stakeholders, right? So one question that I would have or that, that came up here is, what are some of the common roadblocks to people thinking in the systems way? So do people go through this? Do they improve on their systems thinking at the end? Or, you know, and if so, where are times where that worked better or worse interacting with some other thing that happened, right? So were there cases where we did this and something else happened such that people really got it and started thinking about other issues in a systems way, right? Because it can be quite difficult to try and shift these. So you're measuring these shifts in mental models. I'm wondering if you saw some cases where it worked better than in others. Yeah, this is, and, and that really is the, the goal here is to be able to evaluate, well, to, first off, to be able to have solid shifts and a more complete understanding of the, of the local system, um, but also to be able to evaluate that understanding. And so, yeah, right now we're still looking at, first off, I, I don't know if anyone noticed this, but I didn't say anything about um, was there an improvement in understanding? <laughs> uh, just the, the, the research at this point was to just look and see if folks were conceptualizing the interaction of factors differently. Now, whether that's an improvement is still, that's also an area for future research is how do you know if their understanding has improved? What does that mean? Um, but definitely we've had, we've had some workshops that didn't go too well. And that was largely because <laughs> we had people in the room that were kind of antagonizing the, the, the workshop participants. Not antagonizing them directly, but sort of indirectly. Folks in the room that, that where, the, where the stakeholders were like, uh, I don't really want to say, you know, that the, that the government is negatively influencing the community. <laughs> right? And so in many cases, it's really a, a major hindrance is not having the right people in the room. Um, the, 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 the robustness and benefit of a system mapping exercise is uh, lives and dies by the the ability to have the right people in the room, um, and and also just you know we're seeing it in, in, in the United States right. It's hard to change people's paradigms. Um, this is just a one factor mapping exercise, right? But but folks, their mental models have been impacted by their by their surrounding for years and years and years and years. So a lot of these are a lot of these uh, a lot of the understanding that exists is entrenched and, and will, will always persist no matter if you engage them in systems thinking um and so yeah i would say that generally folks that don't i, I suppose don't have an open mind or are very much stuck on their ideas are more likely to not have that sort of shift in their thinking whereas folks that are were facilitated well in, in a workshop were with the right people and who have kept sort of an open mind to Wow, that, that actually there actually are these interactions, and wow, my understanding of that interaction wasn't correct in my mind, I guess, and and now I've been convinced. I've I've talked this over with my with my fellow you know workers or colleagues or what whatnot. This has changed my understanding. Um, it, it really comes down to a, a lot of different factors um, that go into that. But um, well, this stakeholder understanding evaluation research is still is still underway, and, and that'll be a very interesting. To, to point out is what approach had the most shift, what approaches had the, the largest shift in understanding, and what seemed to be hindrance to those shifts, if there are any. Good question. Great. So, so I questions. think what you're saying is you want other people to engage with you on this research, uh, yeah. people that were asking these questions, in order to, to help you try and answer those as a research community. That's what I'm hearing. I mean, I think that, that, absolutely. That, and to be and to do more of these, to do more yeah. of these. Workshops. This sounds really great. Um, so I had, there was a question here, and I think this is an important one that you just sort of touched on, but I want you to perhaps elaborate a little bit if you could. Sure. So this is a representation of the stakeholders understanding their mental model of the system and how it operates. Right. So I have two questions. Number one, and people are asking, you know, I'm going to use this, this classic phrase, people are asking, right? People are asking <laughs> people in the are chat um, around 
was there anything that really jumped out at you that surprised you about you went through this exercise and then you were like, wow, the mental model is like completely different than my understanding that I can get just from talking to them. Right. So, you know, I think this is a key thing when we think about doing development work is, you know, we're telling people as they do design, go do observation, go do interviews, go do talk to people. We're talking to all these people, you're creating, synthesizing a mental model in your mind, how that system works, right? right. And right. now you're creating an explicit representation of how it is in the stakeholder's mind. Was there times where you yourself were very surprised or people in your team were surprised, the facilitator was surprised like, oh, I believe the system to work this way, but the stakeholders all identified this completely different thing that I had, hadn't even considered, or they thought this was important and I didn't think it was important, for, exa for example. So can you, is there, was there a time where you were sort of a counterintuitive result was surfaced by doing this technique? Absolutely, absolutely. So the answer is yes. <laughs> um, for the most part in, in the systems literature, that I've seen this a number of times, and these sort of modeling efforts tend to produce 90% of kind of um, outcomes that would um, confirm a suspicion or by the, by the team. It's like, oh, okay, I, I kind of saw that coming. That, that made sense. And that really just reinforces my idea. And about 10% of the time, it's like, oh my gosh, I did not see that. Um, and um, this is a difficult, uh, this is a difficult notion um, or difficult concept because uh, in many cases, if, if, if a counterintuitive result comes out of the systems diagram, which you would hope for, right? That's, that's like, oh my gosh, like now that, that really sheds some light on an area, on a blind spot, at a place where we should be intervening, but we're, but we're not. It's difficult at times because a lot of times people see that. They'll see. So for example, there's a large shift necessarily um, in the sector, in the water and sanitation sector, towards more uh, sort of utility approaches, sort of preventative maintenance approaches, sort of. I wouldn't say top down, but more, uh, not just having the community maintain the system, but engaging the private sector, engaging local governments and, and, and maintaining the system, which makes a lot of sense. But in some cases, because um, uh, we're engaging local community members who have been engaging community-based management, a lot of times, you know, we, we, we're actually finding that, that the community, the water committee is actually really, really, really important in the system and maintaining, maintaining positive interactions between various components of the system, various factors. And so in, in many cases, we see that the local water committee and the, and the willingness to pay and, and things of that sort are, are really important, but they kind of go against the grain of where existing uh, sort of the, the, the paradigm is going with, with the sector and, and saying, okay, the water committees, uh, the community-based management strategy is no longer as effective as, 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 as we thought it was in the past. We need to have more of a top-down approach which is, again, it's good. Um, in many cases, they, folks will look at that, that particular outcome, which is say the community is, is really important, and say, uh, that doesn't seem to jive well with, with what we're seeing you know, in the sector or the direction of the, of, of the sector. So that would almost point to a, 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 an error in the system diagramming. That, in, that, in other words, this, this, is not, this, this does not represent the, the real system. It's just what the stakeholders think. And so it's really hard to, there's been a number of times where, yes, it's been counterintuitive um, and, and, the, and we, like the influence of politics or the, or the, the importance of, of, of uh, community social dynamics or social cohesion has come up um, where the discussion has been uh, along the lines of, wow, that's, that, that's a really interesting place to focus, um, but, does, but I wouldn't, I don't, that, that doesn't seem to make sense to me. And, and so the, the Really, the difficulty is seeing those sort of counterintuitive things emerge and to not say, oh, well, that invalidates sort of the model itself. Obviously, something's wrong here. Um, and then actually saying, okay, wow, opening, again, this is the open mind idea, looking at it and going, oh, okay, well, then, then what does it mean to potentially target that area of the system? Or maybe we focus another mapping exercise around that area of the system to see if we could drill down and understand it better. Um, but again, yeah, to summarize, yeah, in many cases, we counterintuitive things do come up. And, and the issue is not looking at those things and saying, well, that, that invalidates the model. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I think um, 
I'm going to ask two questions here in response to that. And I think that was a, that was a great answer to, to the question. So, so hopefully people were able to take away that answer the questions, several of the questions that were in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to touch on two things. Number one, I think what we're really talking about is that this is a representation of the stakeholders understanding. And then, but as engineers, when we do this complexity system stuff, often we're drawing these connections from like a first principles perspective. So we assume that that phenomena is true, right? Like that it's a ground truth. And so when you say like, this doesn't invalidate the model, it's like, that's, that's assuming that you're equating the stakeholders paradigm for how the world works with how the world works in some objective sense that the system exists in the real world, right? Um, and so I think one of the things that's interesting about this, and I want to ask a question that was in the Q&A, when you're teaching students about this and, and you want to change the way the engineers are thinking, how do you, do you get across, like, we want people to think in the systems way, but when we're doing that, we have systems that involve people, which is what these are. Mm -hmm. How do we understand this difference? Like, I would imagine that my students, if they're trained, in like an engineering mindset where everything is like a physics there's a right answer right here this is a representation that we want to use to be useful to create interventions which we think will affect the system which includes people right so we need to understand how those people view the system right um and, and so i'm wondering about that tension between okay this is how the stakeholder group views the way the world works their mental model versus perhaps the designer's mental model or the team's mental model or researchers or and perhaps how like the phenomena the actual impact of these different things because you could do like a causal experiment for some of these factors but not for others right it depends on the definition of the factor so i wonder if you could talk a little bit about that tension both about teaching and then the tension even in practice between objective whatever you want to call it and these sort of mental models which are more representations of how people believe the system is working yeah and that that's a really good question jesse thanks for bringing that up <clears throat> um and this has actually been something that i've been up against for the last eight years <laughs> is uh folks saying well you know that's just you're just pulling out a, a, the, the stakeholders understanding of the system that doesn't necessarily mean that is the system um, and that's very, very true. And I don't want to use this as a cop out, um, but there's this, that, that kind of age old system saying all models are wrong, some models are useful. And um, that is to say, <laughs> yeah, no matter what model we create, some models are more accurate than others, but most models still don't quite get at reality. So what, what, if, for a model to be useful, that's, the mo that's kind of a, a, almost more important than it being sort of valid. And, and, and it's kind of, it's cart before the horse or whatever it's if it's useful and it and it actually produces and again we haven't been able to show this this is the this is the blind spot just i'm glad you identified this it's just does the model that the, the stakeholders identify allow them to make decisions and to to, uh, to uh, affect change that ultimately leads to a better outcome of service delivery and if the better outcome takes place you would ideally or hypothetically say Okay, well, that's because their understanding shifted in X, Y ways, and that the mo the modeling exercise was in effect useful, and and ultimately the model that resulted from their their work the workshop was relatively uh, representative of the real local model. Um, but so so really the 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 proof is in the pudding, so to speak. It's really the 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 goal here with this sort of research is is to is to sort of loosen our grip on this idea that all these models have to be fully validated. I, I would love for these models to be able to be validated perfectly in, in a very scientific sort of engineering sense, right? That's the goal. I would love that. And to actually start to be able to put real quantitative insights into these systems diagrams, develop system dynamics models to be able to do virtual sort of simulations and sensitivity analyses. This is where I would love for it to go. But at the present time, it, it's, it's, it needs to be enough to just be able to say, did it change stakeholders' understanding of the system? Did it become a more complete uh, understanding of the system? Did it tend to move towards, and this is a bit hard, but did it tend to move towards, did the understanding move towards a more 
if the sector is going towards preventative maintenance and that's been shown to work better, is the stakeholder understanding going towards tenants and aspects of preventative maintenance? In which case we might say, oh, okay, well then that seems like their understanding has improved or at least been changed through engaging in these systems activities. Um, but really to, to be able to have a validated, a, a, a validated model will require more and more uh, research. Um, and, that's and I think that's gonna be important. That'll build sort of the legitimacy of these methods. Sure, so um, I think we have about five minutes left, so I'm gonna be selfish and ask my question, and then let Perfect, go for it. Great, these have been great questions. questions, thanks, Jesse. Um, well, these else. are questions from the people. And, and everybody great. else, thank you. Uh, so this is my question, so it'll be worse, for sure. Um, so my question, I, I have so many questions, we're gonna have to have a phone call later about I would them. love to. But uh, my question really is about, can we connect this, perhaps, or your thoughts about the future direction of this type of work could we connect some of these things to sort of an implementation science perspective, right? Yes. You're just yes. talking about some of this tension between like the real model, like, oh, well, we understand that this service thing actually, uh, you know, does this, you know, affects the, the sustainability of it. But everybody in the community believes that the government's input is actually the most important thing, right? And so the intervention, if you're saying, okay, well, we're going to try and implement this preventative maintenance structure because we know through past experimentation that this works better um you may have trouble getting adoption of that intervention or uptake of that intervention if their mental model thinks that it's unimportant right and right. so i think that connecting this type of understanding and stakeholder analysis um stakeholder understanding analysis to this larger question of, well, we believe this other thing for some other reason, whether it's physics or prior research, actually has a better impact. Well, that discrepancy may prevent uptake or adoption. And perhaps we need to change the way we're facilitating the implementation or the way we're uh, marketing the implementation uh, to those stakeholders, to that particular stakeholder group. Uh, or provide evidence in a different way such to, to, to think about their shift. And now you can measure their shift in their understanding also, right? So that seems really important. I would think that, the, the, to get to my question, have you looked at creating stakeholder, these maps, these understanding mental model maps for different groups of stakeholders and then measuring the differences between those maps? So that yeah, would be absolutely. like that, that. That would be absolutely. my question. Maybe you could say, like, as a team, hey, stakeholder group one, stakeholder group two have very different mental models, and that means we need to change what we're doing. Absolutely. So this area of alignment. So yeah, this this is something that we've looked at quite a bit. Um, very very good question, um, and I think you you touched on a lot of different things. So really quick, the implementation science aspect of this, I think, is critical. And I, I think it would, that's, that's why we're, I'm seeking to develop sort of a, a consultancy to, to kind of promote sort of thinking and doing, thinking and doing, thinking and doing, doing more mapping, having more case studies, um, doing more evaluations, um, looking, looking at different stakeholder groups, how they conceptualize the system differently. Because um, you're right, that's a really important outcome um, is saying, wow, these different stakeholders see the system very differently. And these stakeholders have their finger on on this button, and these stakeholders are the so and so to speak on this button. Maybe which system needs to be sh not shifted, or what paradigm needs to be shifted? Um, what what sort of understanding is more relevant to uh, the, the sort of the box or the boundary of the system? I mean, if it's if it's at the local community level and they're seeing the system completely different <laughs> from what the uh, let's just say the the regional government is seeing, and then they're and they're kind of the ones that have their, their hands on the purse strings, um, then there's obviously a problem, there's a disconnect there, and that's a place, that, that there would show a place to intervene in the system and saying, okay, we need to, to engage these two stakeholder groups in a robust discussion about why there's, these models are different. Um, but yeah, ultimately this is gonna just require more and more case studies and, and this idea of, of implementation science, implementing, uh, doing a, it's both an implementation of a factor mapping exercise as well as evaluating the implementation, the decisions those stakeholders took as a virtue of or because of that factor mapping exercise. So, yeah, this implementation science is really the center of where this is going. 
and, 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 and iterating. Again, this is all an iterative uh, process of continually, go, continually going back and meeting with the same stakeholders over and over and over again and seeing how their understanding has changed and how the system has changed. So uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, for all of those answers. Uh, we're now out of time, so I'm gonna turn it over to yeah. Yana. I want to just recognize that there were several, more than several questions in the Q&A, which I think were critical yeah. about representation. You were talking about who is in the room right. while you're doing these things, who is the facilitator, who's on the design team. All of these things are incredibly important to building an understanding of the stakeholder uh, group system as a whole. Um, we didn't even touch on how do you identify who the stakeholders are, which I think is another one. You could create a mapping of the stakeholders in a very similar way. Um, yep. And what are their connections? And that might be interesting also. Um, so I just want to recognize for the people that I did not get to your questions. I apologize. We, we've, we've run out of time. I was trying to synthesize as they came in. Um, but uh, Jeff's uh, contact information is there. This whole forum is intended to build connections between everybody that's in the audience right now and the people that are presenting. So, um, you know, in discussions with Jeff before this, this talk, uh, you know, I know that he's happy to try and connect with people um, and discuss some of these questions in a more in-depth basis. And with that note, I wanna thank everyone for joining uh, personally because this is uh, exceeded beyond my wildest dreams, the attendance uh, things that I thought would happen for this type of seminar. So I'm really happy that you guys are all here and asking such great questions. Um, I wanna thank Jeff again for his great talk and I'm gonna turn it over to Yana to uh, wrap it up. So thanks thank again. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Jesse. And I, I wholeheartedly echo the gratitude to Jeff. This has been so enlightening and we've already identified some parallels even in our own programs and how we uh, actually train our, our fellows to conduct interviews. So a micro model of, of your systems uh, uh, approach. So uh, with that, I, I do want to thank everybody for participating. We encourage you to join us for our next seminar, which is going to be next month with Dr. Erica Grala, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Engineering Management and Systems Engineering at George Washington University. So the systems conversations continue, our systems perspectives, which we're so thrilled for. Um, I, I do acknowledge also, as Jesse said, we have a lot of questions that went unanswered just because of time constraints. Um, so if your question didn't get answered and you're very eager and you didn't catch Jeff's contact details, feel free to email us and, and we'll do our very best to convey them. Uh, we might also consider a follow-up article with Jeffrey, uh, compiling some of these questions and, and providing a synthesis to our attendees. Um, with that, I wish you all a, a good afternoon, a, a good evening, or even a good morning, depending where you are right now or when you're listening to this recording. And uh, we hope you'll join us for our next seminar. And uh, thank you all. Goodbye, everyone.